Well, I want to also, I, I want to again acknowledge uh, our sponsors uh, today, um, Navigation Electronics out of Lafayette, as well as uh, Hague and Trammell here in, in Metairie. Or I guess we're in New Orleans here. Metairie's over there, other side of the wall. All right, our next speaker is, uh, is one of uh, the experts. He's the man. It's uh, Bill Henning. He's from National Geodetic Survey. He is their point man for real-time positioning. He's going to come up and talk about how to do it, or better yet, maybe how not to do it, or maybe both. Thank you, Roy. A uh, couple things. Just well, we're going to thank Roy for that hard work of setting this whole thing up. Uh, Cliff Mounier, Randy Osborne, all the guys at LSU slash Center for Geoinformatics slash Louisiana Spatial Reference Center, and in particular Renee Shields, the uh, NGS Height Modernization Manager, for setting up all the stuff. She's right over there to your right for setting all the stuff up from NGS. And particularly, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to sit here today. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with real-time positioning. I probably, all the variables associated with it, I'll probably forget to say something, but I'm going to do my darndest to, to get everything that's in here out to you, and hopefully we can have some, some feedback and some conversation about it. Uh, another thing, I'm used to walking around used to having a lavalier mic and walking from one side of the stage to the other and walking down. It's going to be tough for me to stand here and do this, but for the interest of the, of the camera and the sound and everything, I'm going to try to do my best to do that. Um, I think that takes care of the formalities. So what I want to say is we'll try to cover this stuff, the first uh, one, two, three things before the break. After the break, we'll actually talk about best methods for the field. We're going to start off with understanding where we're standing in positioning technology. Get a sense of that. that we use technology for our work, for our leisure. Things are changing very rapidly. I just want to talk about that very briefly. Uh, then we'll look at maybe what works, how real time works in a generic sense. So we'll try to look inside that black box and see what's going on. I'm going to try to scare the devil out of you with that so you don't put too much trust in pushing that button. I want to talk about that. And then uh, what affects that, the things that affect real-time positioning. And then we'll get into the best methods for the field, the seven C's of NOAA. Uh, these PowerPoints uh, will be available. Um, Roy, Renee, are they going to be available to everybody online or something? Or Yes, they will be available. Also, I put them on our FTP site. There's a link to it later on in the day with a bunch of other links, so you can wait to write that down if you want. It's essentially what you're going to see here today with a, some slight modification. Okay. I apologize, but every time I speak, I do this in the morning before I speak. I change things, so I apologize. All right. Now, change and positioning technology. Cartoon graph. Do you notice that there's a, if you will, an exponential curve on the right side of the screen? That's sort of where we are now. So it's not, we're not changing at a, at a uniform rate. We're changing at an exponential rate. Back here in 2700 BC when I started, we were just using sticks and strings. And labor intensive all the way through, right? Compass, the Adelite, improvements in technology, but very labor intensive always. Now, what happened? Technology took off. Total station. When the total station came out, surveyors, geodesists, lost the title of the only expert measures. Policemen started carrying total stations around in their cruisers, getting it out and doing forensics for the accident scenes. People could measure now with a push of a button. Uh, I see some young people and I see some older people, not that we're old, we're getting better, right? Uh, but do you remember measuring traverses with a steel tape? Any of you out there? And we were the only guys to do that, right? I mean, 
you know, we could do that really well. You started on the dumb end of the chain, you work your way to the front end of the chain. Well, gone, right? We're on this slope now. We're somewhere around here where these real-time networks are, are starting to really take off in the, in the United States. And where we're heading, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it'll be awesome. The thing is, when you go to LSU or any other college and you take a technology course, when you graduate, you better be prepared to update your, yourself as you go because what you learned in college is already pretty much out of date. Okay, so we're in this exponential curve. Uh, this guy here, Dr. Michio Kaku, I don't know if anybody knows him or knows that name, he's a theoretical physicist, but he writes books for the layman. Really good books, and I recommend him to you. But he noted that scientific knowledge is doubling every 10 years. It's probably every eight years now. But he was saying between 87 and 97, the scientific knowledge produced in that 10 year span was greater than the history of mankind. So just get a sense of where we are now. Where we're heading, I don't know. Here's where we were, 1970. To be a surveyor, all you need is this big 68 piece kit. And it's exciting, it's prestige. You just send away for the kit, hey, voila, you're a surveyor. It's great. This is a Monroe mechanical calculator. I don't know if anybody remembers these in the offices. Dave does. But, uh, you know, if you were working in the field as I was then, you, you hit the buttons and divide by zero and work out and walk out and go to the field. And, and the thing will run for about a half an hour trying to do that computation. So it used to drive people crazy. This is the actual uh, calculator I used for my party chief test in the early 70s. And my wife spent hundreds of dollars for this, you know. And at the time, you know, it had these buttons, trick, trick buttons, of course. But when I saw it, I saw this tan button. I knew I didn't need that because I worked outside. And it had a sin button. I kept hitting the sin button, but nothing was happening. Anyway, you know, so, and that was only, you know, 30, 34 years ago, something like that. Does, does anybody know what that is? It's a GPS receiver. That's the Generalized Development Model by Rockwell Collins. Two-seat coupe, convertible, got its own air conditioner, about 300 pounds or so, five channels, big five. And that was used to test the GPS constellation 30-some years ago. We've come a long way, and we're, it's increasing. We have to understand that. In 10 years, with the European system, you, you heard Cliff Mounier talk about the, uh, the systems yesterday, if you were here. Um, but with the European Galileo system, the Russian GLONASS system, the Chinese Compass Beidou system, some local systems, quasi zenith satellite system for Japan, et cetera, et cetera, Gagan, India, they're not counting those two, two last ones. Maybe 115 satellites up there in 10 years. What does that mean? It means that you'll be walking around with your pocket Ronco GPS receiver autonomously getting probably better than a half a foot positioning autonomously, without any corrections. So it's pretty scary. And not only are the constellations being populated, but the signals are increasing. We're adding uh, another frequency, L5, you know, more code signals, L2C, you know, all these other things that are being added to the GPS constellation. It's going to be crazy. This is from the, uh, the uh, Esri uh, survey summit last year. A couple points I just wanted to make here. If you read the first thing, it says uh, pretty soon, it'll be four years now, all the Earth will be covered 24 7 by satellite coverage. And mapping cities is lagging behind. So there's work for us surveyors, if you're a surveyor, engineer. But only 16% of the cities are right now mapped. So there's work there. Plus, we'll see indoor positioning and underground location to populate GIS. So things are moving toward remote location away from labor. Remote location away from labor. And you're gonna hear me say it probably half a dozen times today, from marks in the ground to antennas in the air. That's where we're moving. So what's happening is this. Technology is pushing all these geospatial professionals to centimeters, even GIS, even mapping. So all these guys are going to meet somewhere 
Everybody working in centimeters. Everybody's going to be working in centimeters. And maybe this will be the curriculum then. It'll be a geospatial professional. And you'll have uh, areas of expertise like, say, boundary surveying, uh, you know, for people that are into land surveying, things like that. But we're heading toward the same thing, I think, in 10 years. This is my own opinion, by the way, but it's pretty evident which where we're heading. All right. If you don't mind, I'm going to get a drink of water and we'll continue. We're going to start talking about real-time positioning now. That was the end of the change thing. Does anybody disagree with what I just said? Okay. All right, real-time positioning. Some guidelines are out right now, published by the NGS. They're available on the website. There's the link, and that will be available later on the same screen if you want it. It's 150-some pages, counting appendices, definitions, you know, but there's only, you know, maybe about 50 pages of the meat, if you will. Um, single base, it's called single base GNSS positioning. That could be from an active station, could be from a mark in the ground, but it's still based on a base station and a rover, right? It'll be around for a while. It'll be around for a while. The, the uh, real-time networks, which we'll talk about after lunch, uh, when we get through this stuff, and we hopefully we we'll, won't be too groggy after eating, um, the real-time networks uh, provide a uh, interpolated correction, but you still end up with a, a, a baseline from one particular station. I'll explain that. So, real-time positioning from single base Areas without cell coverage for real-time networks, you need to set up your own base station. Um, certain applications are using single base extensively, machine guidance and things like that, precision agriculture, legacy equipment, things like that. Areas without cell coverage especially is, is where you need to have single base. So anyway, these guidelines were, are still important. A lot of the practices in these guidelines are applicable toward real-time network positioning. Okay, so it's, an, it's a big document. Um, but the intent was to provide a background for real-time positioning, as we'll cover briefly here today, and to provide guidelines for getting uh, certain accuracies or precisions, if you will, at 95% confidence. And we'll see that summary table as we go through this. All right. We're at, right now, remember that exponential curve. We're at a point where we have a confluence of technology going on. We're getting better and better and better and better. You've got better cell coverage, better uh, communication across the country, faster communication, better equipment, very important, better firmware and software. The equipment that's used now is much better than it was 10 years ago. It's better multipath rejection. You can go further and get an answer, and you can repeat your, your position better with new equipment. So. Um, more constellations we uh, mentioned and more codes and frequencies. So all these things are aiding real-time positioning. Your baseline choices are roughly divided into these three things. You can set your own base station up, right? You find a monument and you go out with your equipment and set your, your gear up. You can use a spread spectrum radio. Pretty, has pretty good integrity, but you can't go real far. Line of sight, maybe. Uh, you can use a UHF radio. Uh, your base station may be 25, 35 watts. You're going to need an FCC license for your frequencies. But you can go three miles, five miles, six miles. Um, data is secondary to voice over the cell network. So if you have a trucker on the interstate and you're trying to use a certain channel, if he has a harmonic of that channel or at the same frequency or whatever, you're going to get walked on. You're going to lose your data. That's the problem with radio transmission. In an urban area, you have a lot of interference. You're not going to be able to go as far, all right? But that's a good option. It's the one option that a lot of us still use. Also, you can also get a, a data modem, CDMA modem, a, you know, GSM modem, whatever it may be, a card in your phone or a service provided, and you can go as far as you can go and get a fixed solution. Uh, there'll be something you have to be aware of with that, and that's the part per million, but we'll talk about that. So you can go a long way with single base, but you have to be aware of certain things. Now, what about the second thing on the right there? Still single base, but it's from an active reference station. 
you're going to always use a data modem for that because you're going to go much further. You're going to be able to go much further. Again, though, the problem is the data is there 24-7, 365, but you still have a, a, an accumulated error the further you go, linearly dependent from that distance from the base station. And then you have to the left there a lot of bang for the buck. A lot of you know that because you work in golf net down here. But the real-time networks, they're operated by somebody else. And they have a network of stations providing you data in real time with interpolated solutions to where your rover is. We'll talk briefly about that later. All right, now, what the GPS constellation works in is XYZ. Well, what, what XYZ? Well, any datum, any geodetic datum, has some, some components to it. It has a surface. And we heard Cliff talk about this yesterday, about the different ellipsoid surfaces, okay? We know that, that NAT83 and the International Terrestrial Reference System work in a certain ellipsoid called GRS-80. WGS-84, by our Department of Defense, who operates the GPS constellation, works in the WGS-84 ellipsoid. Well, what's the difference between those two? Not much. Not much at all. They're, the difference in those two would translate to a couple millimeters between Alaska and Florida if you put them the same place. If you put them the same place. That's the catch. Where do you put that thing? That's the realization of that datum becomes a, da a data frame realization. It's defined by an origin, by orientation parameters that are, uh, you know, a meridian and an equator, if you will, defining that part of the ellipse, and uh, gravity, and a scale, of course, how big or small it is. So those things define that datum. Resting on top of that datum, if you take the center of origin, uh, center of mass of this quantity, this mathematical model of the Earth, if you will, zero, 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 X, Y, Z, Z through the pole, X through the equator, 90 degrees, right-hand coordinate system, Y through the equator, X, Y, Z. The WGS-84 GPS system is maintained in X, Y, Z. Our orbits are X, Y, Z, and that's where they come from. It comes from that origin of the WGS-84 ellipsoid in the WGS-84 datum, okay? So, and I'll show you, we, we transform that to NAT83 or whatever we work in. Some things about real time in a generic sense. You understand that the GNSS manufacturers have very proprietary uh, algorithms and programs that they work within their equipment. They don't want to tell you what they are. But there are certain principles we can look at anyway in a generic sense, okay? XYZ, remember we just talked about XYZ? The coordinates of a rover come from the difference in XYZ from a base station. I don't care whether it's your base station, it's somebody else's base station, it's a non-physical base station, your coordinates on your rover end up being a vector or a baseline, delta X, delta Y, delta Z from a base station. So it's, in that sense, real-time positioning is always differential, okay? The rover will get its corrections from a base station or from, well, it'll still be from a base station, but it might be interpolated to the site of the rover or not, or not. So it makes a difference how you're working. Um, and the positioning of a rover is multilateration, like trilateration, only with a bunch more satellites, okay? So it's just an intersection of distances. That's all it is. There's intersections of distances when you run it through least squares and take into account all the error factors, end up with your position. Delta X, Y, Z from the base gives you the coordinate. The rover will use corrections from the base or from the network, which establishes the base, if you will. Okay? The thing about real-time positioning that enables us to do surveying work and engineering work, and indeed geodesy, is the fact that a bunch of smart guys got together, and they saw that, okay, well, gee, the Department of Defense is giving us these codes on these, from these satellites, you know, on these different frequencies, and we can do that, and we can get our position to, I don't know, 100 meters maybe, or, you know, maybe 50 meters, or maybe 30 meters, or maybe better. Well, 
Years ago, a bunch of scientists said, you know what? They're being modulated onto these, these waves, all right? We know the frequency of those waves. We know the wavelength of those waves. If we knew how many of those things were, we could just multiply times the, the wavelength and know the distance. And we'd know the distance to this instead of this, okay? And that's, that's where we are. That's what we do now. It, the Department of Defense didn't mean it to happen that way, but it did. So that's why we can get centimeters, because we use the actual wavelength of the signals coming down, L1, L2, and now L5. The only thing is, it, unlike the codes, which are time tagged, when they leave the satellite, whenever you pick them up, take the difference in time times the speed of light, your distance, right? There's no time tag on the cycles. So you've got to figure out how many there are. Not real easy. And that, to me, as we step through these things, I want you to understand how amazing this technology is, to me anyway. I mean, the signal coming from a GPS satellite is less than 40 watts, less than 40 watts. And it's coming down 12,000 miles through the atmosphere, ionosphere, troposphere, you know, multipath, uh, interference. All these things are affecting that signal. We're picking it up on our little antenna here and positioning ourselves to centimeters. I, to me, it's just amazing. Anyway, so we have to account for those factors that affect the signal in order to get a good answer. And dual frequency is the way you want to go. Well, can you use single frequency and do real time? Sure, you can. Not, you can't use it for Opus right now. No, never, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what Mark said yesterday. Anyway, so dual frequency is the way to go because for one thing, the cost of the receivers have come so far down that most people can afford dual frequency. That in the old days, it used to be, well, I don't know. I think I'll just get L1, you know, we'll do static positioning, it's okay. You want to get dual frequency, because there's a lot of things you can do with those different frequencies, all right? You can combine them in different ways to mitigate some of that error. So here's the, here's the signal coming down, and you know this, when the receiver locks onto those satellites, it kind of knows what part of that wavelength it locked on, what part of that cycle, okay? But it doesn't know this. It doesn't know the rest of them, how many were behind it. So that's what it has to figure out. It does it with least squares in an iterative, iterative process, excuse me. Once it can compute that, it would know that distance on that frequency, uh, to, uh, distance to the satellite, and it can do the uh, adjustment of the position with other information from other satellites. When it locks on, when it resolves the integer, right now it's an integer ambiguity. We don't know how many. When we fix that, fix the am integer ambiguity, we've come up with an answer. By the way, in your data collector, a lot quicker now, I know, but when you first turn on, you, you dial into a network or you, you, you turn on relative to your base station, you'll see your, your collector will say float, right, a lot of times. What does that mean? Well, it means it hasn't figured out how many cycles. It hasn't come to an answer yet. It's come to kind of an answer. It's come to a cycle decimal point something. So it has a bunch of decimals after that decimal point, but it can't be a decimal point. It has to be a certain number. So it hasn't decided that yet. That's a float solution, and you'll see it usually count down while it's trying to figure out its answer. Once it figures that answer out, bam, centimeters, right? A fixed solution. That means it computed how many cycles to each satellite on each frequency, okay? Float, fixed. Once it does that, it'll carry that forward. It'll carry that forward. It, it does it for a certain epoch of time, carries that count forward. The difference it accumulates is it becomes the difference in positioning for, for uh, positions of the rover, okay? Now, said about frequency combinations, um, the way that the rover comes to an answer is very pretty darn fast. What, maybe 10 seconds? I don't know, 15 seconds, you know, to go fixed. But some of the things it uses are frequency combinations, okay? It can take the L1 frequency less the L2 frequency so 1575.42 minus 1227.60, 
divided into the speed of light, and instead of a wavelength uh, of 19 centimeters, you've got a wavelength of 86 centimeters. Okay, that's called a wide lane. So there's a lot easier to figure out how many of these guys there are than how many of these guys there are. So once it solves that wide lane, it can then back out and figure each frequency. Okay? So wide laning. Narrow laning is just the opposite. It's the addition of the two frequencies into the speed of light. And you see the wavelength is 11 centimeters. Well, that's, not, that's less than the L1 wavelength of 19 centimeters. Yeah, yeah but you can check uh, cycle slips. You can check your solution with it. So it's still a powerful tool. Um, also, and I probably should wait to do this later, maybe I will. You can reduce the first order ionospheric effect on the GPS signal using a frequency combination. And I'll explain that in a little bit. And some other stuff, uh, common filtering is just predicting, you know, if it knows you're moving, if it knows you're walking or driving or in an airplane, it would expect the next solution to be here. It would expect the next solution to be here. It would expect the next solution to be here. You'll see outliers to that and you think, oh, well, wait a minute. It'll be thinking, say, wait a minute, okay, those are outliers. I don't want them. I think I should be here. So it's dumping solutions and narrowing its solution set down so you can decide. All right, now, this is simply a cookbook. This isn't, you know, integral calculus or anything. This is just a cookbook of the number of cycles between a satellite and a receiver and all the stuff that affects it. All right, you've got uh, a topocentric range to the satellite in meters and then they convert that to cycles. And you've got hardware delays, uh, excuse me, uh, clock biases in the receiver, clock biases in the satellite, hardware delays in the satellite, hardware delays in the, in the receiver. You've got ionospheric air or effects, you've got uh, tropospheric effects, you've got multipath, and you've got, if you will, white noise or, or noise in the receiver. The better the receiver, the less the white noise. So anyway, add all that stuff together and you get the number of cycles. All right, so it has to account for those things. Well, one, one, one of the things it does do is use differencing. And that Differencing concept is that it eliminates common errors by just taking the difference in between two receivers in a satellite or two satellites in a receiver. I'll show you what I mean. By doing that, you eliminate this stuff. Uh, this is taken care of, whether it's a network or a single base, I'll explain that, and you're left with that. So here's, here's what differencing is. All right. Single difference can be two satellites and one receiver, or it could be two receivers and one satellite. And why do I say that? Well, consider this scenario where you have two receivers and one satellite. So this green line, these green lines, the observables coming down from that satellite to each receiver have common elements. They have errors from the satellite, right? Both of them have errors, and they have the same errors from the satellite. So if you took this one and subtracted this one from it, you would then eliminate those errors. They would just cancel out because they're common to both. That's a single difference. Conversely, you could take two satellites and one receiver. What's common there? Well, the receiver errors are common to this observable and this observable. Okay, so if you take that frequency minus the other frequency, you eliminate the common errors at the receiver. Combine the two of them and you have what's called a double difference. Double difference. So what does that do? It eliminates the clock errors, uh, the hardware errors or delay in both the satellite and the receiver by doing that. Okay, you know, and then you could take it a step further for triple difference, but I want to talk about that right now. So what you're doing is you're eliminating these guys, okay? Now, the ionosphere is up there with electrons bouncing around. The troposphere is our weather. Those two things are assumed to be the same in single base positioning. Well, why is that? It's because the rover uses the corrections from the base station. So the base station's here. This is where I'll be walking around, okay? <laughs> so the base station's here, and the rover's in the flag, all right? And the, ro the, the base station's sitting here. You've typed in a coordinate for that base station, right? So 
you know, and it converts it to XYZ. And then you've got an XYZ coordinate being broadcast down from the satellite. Well, so the receiver says, okay, I, I see where I am, and I see where the coordinate is for this epoch of time. All right, my distance should be this. Whoops, it's not. All right. So it, it computes a correction. All right. That's sent to the rover, and the rover says, oh, I see what the correction is for satellite 27, L1. I'm going to use that. And that's the way the rover for single base computes its, its corrections from the base. Now, you can see the further you get away from the base, the less that's likely to be true, that they use the same corrections. But in this, this scenario, in single base, these are going to be assumed to be the same. So they, they're insignificant to the solution because whatever the base corrects, the rover's going to correct too. So what's left? What's left is multipath, which is the bugaboo of real-time positioning. That's something you can't entirely eliminate. Again, new receivers are better than old receivers with this. But think how long you're there. What, five seconds? That's not a lot of time to mitigate some multipath that's going on. So it's up to the field person to understand multipath. Remember, the, the control with real time, the control is always at the pole. The control is at the pole. It's up to you. It's not back at the gun. It's not back with the party chief keeping notes. It's not back in the office. The control, the result of a real time survey is up to the person in the field carrying that pole around. So that's one thing the person has to know because this cannot be eliminated by differencing. Well, to my, to my knowledge, anyway, I'll put it that way. And then white noise, the little noise in the receiver. Insignificant, really, to the real-time solution. You know, it might be a millimeter or two or something like that. But it's not significant to the solution. And then it, that would leave, then, the topocentric range in meters to the satellite when it can start to solve its position, multilateration. Okay, so that's just that cookbook and how some of those errors can be eliminated. All right, now, it's trying to figure out how many cycles from each satellite to, to, to the receiver, okay? So it can, it can get a distance. Well, if you only had two satellites, all these circles would be possible intersections of even number of cycles from two satellites, okay? They'd all be intersect possible. If you have three satellites, it significantly narrows it down, doesn't it? If you have four satellites, it'd be better. If you have five satellites, that's what you need for real-time positioning. Five satellites. X, Y, Z, remember X, Y, Z, time and redundancy. Five satellites for real-time positioning, at least. Um, as opposed to static, you know, four satellites or even sometimes three. All right, so then one epoch of time to the next. Remember, it's trying to solve this for one epoch of time, epoch of time, if you will. Well, what happens if you compare that one with the next one? Well, then you get something like this Venn diagram thing going on. And the, the possible solutions at this e epoch, or epoch as I say, is intersected with the next e epoch, and you have these possible solutions. So it narrows it down that way, epoch to epoch to epoch, or epoch to epoch to epoch. Now, wide laning. Remember we talked about wide laning, combining the frequencies? So if this, this is possible with, I don't know, what is it? five satellites or whatever. Um, these white circles are possible solutions, say, of the integer count. But if you use a wide lane, look how it narrows it down to just four solutions, from 16 to four. Okay, so all these techniques can be used by the receiver to figure out the integer count of wavelengths. So you end up with a solution A, okay? A solution A of some kind that it works within uses these techniques to figure out what count works from all the satellites together, you know, or each as an intersection. Okay, it's got to figure that out. These squares, iterative process, okay, and it comes to an answer. Manufacturers say the integer resolution, ambiguity resolution, is 99.9% .9 right. Well, it probably is. But you'll see, a, once in a while, you get a bad initialization. Once in a while. So you have to be aware of that. The good thing is, as you move, 
the receiver keeps track of that and says, wait, wait, wait a minute, something's not right here. Something's going on here. This isn't right. And it'll reinitialize and figure out another solution. So it will reinitialize by itself. But until it does, <laughs> um, you have to be, you know, you have to check something. All right. Now, this slide is meant to scare the crawfish etouffee out of you. Okay, so this is, this is a GPS constellation, 31 satellites, call it 32 satellites, 12,000 miles in the air. Now, here's your receiver, here's satellite 23 going 8,400, 9,000 miles an hour overhead. Meanwhile, you're on the Earth going about 800 miles an hour in a different direction. Okay, this receiver has to figure out what it thinks is the number of cycles between that satellite and it. And here's another satellite, and here's another satellite, and here's another satellite. They're all going 8,400, 9,000 miles an hour in different directions. You're going 800 miles an hour in a different direction than they are. It has to figure out the intersection of these guys, which one is right, while you're moving that fast with all these effects in the atmosphere coming down to you. In addition to that, what has to be done with the GPS constellation is <laughs> general and, sp and special relativity. Because the satellites are going so fast, they're so far away, and they're in different gravity than the Earth bound, the, the uplink to those satellites actually take into account a difference in time based on Albert's relativity. Okay? Plus, as the signal comes to you, as the satellite's moving to you, what's it doing? It's compressing itself like Doppler, like a railroad train, right? Coming to you on the tracks. Woo! And it goes by you. Woo! Doppler. Okay? So as it's coming to you, it's compressing the signal. Well, the receiver has to take that into account. If it's, going far, if it's leaving, going further away, it elongates the signal. It has to take that into account. It has to create what's called a beat phase. So all that is done Understanding that one billionth of a second in time is 30 centimeters, okay? And we're trying to get an answer to two centimeters, okay? One billionth of a second. That's what we're doing in 10 seconds or 15 seconds. I think that's amazing. So here's some of the stuff that's happening. Uh, it's going through the ionosphere. It's going through the troposphere. All these effects... And this is the turpus field. <laughs> I don't know why that's a misspelled, but it is. And anyway, there's, there's this jamming and interference and multipath and, and uh, you know. But these are the two main atmospheric components. If you add these errors up, uh, you get around five meters, okay, as, as the, you know, some of the squares of the errors, square root. So uh, that's about what we get, isn't it, when we're out there with our just autonomously, three meters, five meters, something like that just walking around. So we have to take that, take all those things into account to get our position. Now remember I said about frequency combinations and the iono-free solution and how you can use a combination of frequencies to, to, to mitigate that first order error? It's a dispersive medium up, up there in the ionosphere. There's a bunch of electrons bouncing around, but it affects the signals differently according to their frequency, inversely according to their frequency. So the higher the frequency, the less it's affected by that ionosphere. Okay, so it's affected less on L1 than L2. Okay, so they can do modeling using an equation to eliminate that error. Okay, so that, that helps. Now, when it goes to the troposphere, that does not affect the signals differently. It's called a geometrical pr problem. So the orbits, uh, the, the tropospheric uh, errors or delays, are geometrical. It just depends where you are. It doesn't depend what frequency you're looking at. So that has to be taken into account too. The dry part is easy to model. The wet part's not so easy. Now a real-time network spread apart, what, 50 kilometers? What's golf net, Roy? 50, 30, 70? Okay, so 50 to 70 kilometers apart. And you're in the middle. So, so you know, you're 15 miles from the nearest base station, it's got to interpolate something for where you are, and it has to interpolate those conditions. So 
that's why what a real-time network does is really cool too. So anyway, single base, you can see those things are going to affect you. The further you get away from your base, because the rover's using those corrections, the further you get away, you know, the more error you can introduce. All right. So you, so you look at the, uh, this is like from the, pe the geodetic people in Germany, the BKG. It was high, and I'll explain that. In uh, 2000, 2002, you could expect 13, 14 centimeters error at 10 kilometers. When it's a more benign condition, like it was in the mid-90s, it's only a couple centimeters. And the thing is, at 30 kilometers, a real-time network would still give you less than a couple centimeters error to deal with. So there's a benefit of a real-time network going further. Now, the, the gold standard has always been, don't go further than 10 kilometers from your base station. So that's, that's why they say that, because they figure 10 kilometers, one part per million, a centimeter error. Okay, so we can live with that. If you go further than that, larger error, maybe harder to do. New equipment does a lot better than that. Um, one, one of the guidelines we'll talk about, if you're using single base, or even in a network condition, try not to do anything important if something is affecting the base that's not affecting where you are with the rover. So if you have a front moving over the base, if you have rain at the base, you know, uh, you know a weather front, anything like that, and your rover is somewhere else in the sun, you're going to get that wrong modeling of that condition. Okay, so you want homogeneous conditions between the base and the rover. All right, here's the orbits. All right, now, we heard Mark say yesterday, when the orbits you get from NGS or from IGS, uh, ultra rapid, rapid, or precise, work fine. But with real time, we don't get that. We get the broadcast orbit that the satellite sends down. Okay, so that means this. While this guy is traveling 30,000 kilometers, this red line is where the satellite um, says, it, uh, says it is in the, in the broadcast orbit, okay? This green line is where the satellite really was. That's what you would get from the precise orbit, okay? This blue line, uh, excuse me, this is not what you'd get from the precise orbit. This blue line is the model of that post-fit orbit. But what you get from the satellite in the broadcast orbit could be a couple meters from where it is. Doesn't mean your position's gonna be a couple meters. It just means this introduces an error, that's all. Okay, just to be aware of that. So you add them all up, all these errors, 3D, 95% confidence, and you get about four centimeters, which would meet manufacturer spec, okay? But you could still, and that's at 10 kilometers. So do you do better than that? Sure, most times, but you could still have four centimeters to meet manufacturer spec. Now the weather, uh, the uh, space weather is interesting. Um, this, these folks at the Space Weather Prediction Center of NOAA are working hard to get more and more um, current information to us in the field and in the office. The condition is this. Sunspot activity is a good indication of, you know, the activity in the sun that throws out all these coronal mass ejections and particles and comes toward the Earth and hits the ionosphere and stirs everything up and creates a big mess could charge the satellites electrically, could do all sorts of things. It goes in cycles. Every 11 years, very, pretty regularly, since 1700. Now I wanna know who did that in 1700. But they did, somehow. Anyway, 11, every 11 years, there's a peak. Uh, the amplitude is different, but about every 11 years. So we're expecting another peak somewhere around 2013, about a year after the world ends. So, That'll be a peak. Now, what'll happen then is either temporarily or maybe for an hour or maybe even longer, you'll have an inability to fix, maybe, get a fixed solution, or an inability to communicate with a network or your base. So you can expect some kind of stuff going on like that. This is the site. You can go there and read this. If you have trouble falling asleep, I really recommend this. You can get all sorts of great stuff here. But there's three different kinds of storms. The, the, Biggest is the geomagnetic, so you want to you want to take, keep an eye on that. You can you can go there and tell them to send you email. 
you can get all sorts of email messages and warnings and alerts and everything else sent to you by these guys. Uh, I subscribe to it just so they, when I, I know when something like this happens, when a stronger event happens, um, you'll get an, another message. They're saying this K index is seven. That's high. That'll be, that'll be an effect on what you're doing with real time. So you can get these guys to send you messages. Um, yeah, okay. So single frequency, again, uses a model for the ionospheric activity. Uh, therefore, it's not going to be robust, and it's going to have more dramatic error in those kind of conditions. Okay, so again, dual frequency. Let's see how far we're supposed to go here. We're supposed to go to 945. Okay. You all right? All right, so big picture issues with real time position. And we'll talk about these a little bit as we go through these. Okay. But understand, again, I'm going to be talking about minus in the ground, passive marks, and the 10 is in the air, active stations. We're moving toward these guys, right? Away from the marks in the ground. Still going to be valuable. But as we move ahead in time, those passive marks will be our secondary access to the National Spatial Reference System. As we move ahead, right now they're very important, very important. But they're going to have less importance as we move into the future. More importance to these antennas, okay? Uh, grid ground, um, what do you use for your orthometric heights? Do you use the real-time network? Well, if you do, you're going to use the geoid model. Or do you hold your passive marks around a project, localized to them? Yes. Or uh, accuracy, precision, redundancy, um, do, what about GLONASS and, and using that? So some of these things we'll talk about. Now, GLONASS and GPS. Here's the bottom line as we sit here today. GLONASS added to a good GPS uh, number of satellites. When I say good amount, I mean six or seven will not give you a better answer, okay? It will give you an answer where you can't get an answer with just GPS, okay? So as we sit here today, the GLONASS helps, but it does not give you a better solution uh, than GPS by itself if you have enough satellites. And the PDOP, of course, there's so many variables, and the PDOP's not high and blah, blah, blah. But let's uh, just say that, just quantify it like that. You can use GLONASS for areas where you're having trouble picking up satellites. So if, if you have five GPS, you can do a real-time solution. If you only have two GPS, you're not going to be able to do real-time. If you add GLONASS to it, four GLONASS satellites, you're going to be able to do real-time. The thing is, look at these differences between GLONASS and GPS. First of all, GLONASS uses a bunch of different frequencies in the same codes. Frequency division, multiple access. GPS uses a bunch of different codes in the same frequencies. Code division, multiple access. There's a different datum for GLONASS. There's different clocks for GLONASS. All those things have to be modeled to, to get it into what we use. All right? So that's, it's not easy, but it works. It works OK, and it's getting better and better and better. They're, hmm, I'm not sure they've reached full operational cap capability yet. They were almost there. They shoot three up and two fall down. They're three up and two fall down. But they're, they're just about there now. I think if they're not fully operational capability, they will be very soon. Does anybody know if they are yet or not? I'm, I think they're close. They were within one, I think, of being full operational uh, capability. Now, what GLONASS is doing, though, they're starting to, in the newer satellites they're sending up, they're starting to put in a, a beta signal, if you will. And that beta signal is going to be a CDMA code division multiple access like GPS that are starting to broadcast that too. Okay, so that's interesting. So if you're down by St. Louis Cathedral and you're trying to do some real time, it's, you know, you've got this urban stuff going on. That's when GLONASS can help you. Or if you're in the park and you're trying to do a, a road job that goes between a row of trees, GLONASS can help you. Or if you're by the Superdome and you're trying to get some shots and you've got one area of the sky that's blocked by an obstruction. GLONASS can help you. So those kind of scenarios are when the added satellites can really help you. I will tell you, if you've got seven satellites and GPS, you don't really need it. And sometimes you'll have trouble 
resolving that with GPS and GLONASS. If you have problems, turn GLONASS off and just use GPS. Uh, this is just an example of what I was saying. If you've got a obstruct, if you're doing a, a road corridor, you know, and, and you've got trees on both sides, um, you can see that with just GPS, this is the number four satellites. You, you really are not going to work until after 11 o'clock in the morning with just GPS in that scenario. With GLONASS, you've got nine, ten satellites the whole day and more. So you can work. This is the dilution of precisions, all right? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But basically, it's the geometry of the satellites. It's a unitless number. It has to do with their position in the sky. It's an error multiplier, the pseudo range, blah, blah, blah. But basically, we have parameters, we say. Don't use, don't do real-time positioning with a PETA operator than four. St stuff like that. So the position dilution of precision is horizontal vertical. But look at these guys. They're off the charts. You can't work there with just GPS. But you can with GLONASS. This is a different scale, by the way. This is three. This guy was, here's three down here. This is 19. So you see, see how GLONASS can help you when you don't have enough GPS satellites. So that's GLONASS GPS. Now, Galileo is coming around, but it'll be many, many years before that, that's available to us. I think, I don't know, seems how much more money we send to China, maybe they'll be available before. All right, so if you have eight GPS satellites, if you have a geometrical dilution of precision, which takes into account horizontal, vertical, and time, of one and a half, if you have a distance of a couple kilometers from a base station, if you have a RMS, and you, that your collector is showing you, of a centimeter or so, you're loving life, and assuming you don't have multipath. That's your home free, all right? In a real-time network, the things we look for are pretty much the same, uh, but it would be nice to have seven satellites. So these are some of the got, you know, recommendations, if you will, for real-time networks. Five seconds for a minute, uh, get an RMS two centimeters or better, four vertical or ellipsoid, get two locations redundant, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about some of that. This is what you're after. The key to real-time positioning is you will never have confidence in a real-time position unless you have redundancy. Okay? You will never have confidence in a real-time position unless you have redundancy. The only way to have confidence in a real-time position. Even if you meet all that criteria, even if you meet that, you, you don't know. For some reason, it, it, you'll, you'll get a bad position sometimes. All right, so now remember that the satellites up there are in the World Geodetic System 84, ellipsoid and datum, X, Y, Z, right? Well, you're going to get that, and it's going to take that, well, the PZ parameters of the Earth 90.02 for GLONASS, and it's going to convert that to WGS84. Then, then to get what we work in, our national datum of NAT83, right? It's going to transform that to NAT83. Then we're going to take NAT83, and we don't usually work in latitude, longitude, ellipsoid height, do we? We usually work in a mapping surface of some kind, usually state plane coordinates, right? At least that's the way I always did it. So it'll take that, provide the projection parameters, and give you a state plane coordinate with an ellipsoid height. All right, I don't want an ellipsoid height, I want an orthometric height. Well, then there's something you have to do. And one of the things you can do is add the geoid model, the hybrid geoid model, which is built to work with 983. Then you get an orthometric height in NAVD88. So it's taken XYZ, WGS, and you're ending up with state plane coordinates with an NAVD88 in your collector. It's doing that. All right? Your other choice for the elevations is to do a localization or calibration or alignment to passive marks, whatever terminology you want to use to project control around your site. And that's indeed the best way to work with a real-time network right now. All right, precision and accuracy. Precision and real-time positioning is going to be the rover's alignment to the base station or the rover's alignment to the real-time network. That's precision. 
That's what your data collector will always show you, precision. Okay, it'll say one centimeter horizontal and two centimeters, it'll, it'll say vertical, but orthometric height. And an RMS, right? That has nothing to do with accuracy. If you have an autonomous base station and you just said, well, use my autonomous position here, that would show you the same result. Same exact result, because all that is is the alignment to the base station. How that a base station aligns to your truth, your truth hopefully is the national datum, but whatever your truth is, how that base station aligns to that is accuracy. So your rover is always going to be less accurate than your base station because there's air in that baseline, right? Unless you're lucky. You might luck out. So precision and accuracy. Same thing with a real-time network. When your rover's out in a real-time network and golf net, precision is how you're going to line the golf net. Precision. And then what does it say? Oh, okay, I got, uh, all right, I got two centimeters horizontal and, well, I got five worth of metric height, but I'm going to, lo I'm going to localize, <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about it. All right, that's precision. That's how you're aligned to the network. Glad I woke everybody up for that. And uh, accuracy is how golf net is aligned to the truth. What is the truth? Well, we hope, in NGS, we hope that truth is the National Spatial Reference System. That way everybody's playing on the same page. Okay? All right, now, good. We're coming up to the break, but I wanted to throw some of these slides up here. Raise your hand if you know, if you've heard of light squared. Okay, good. This is a big issue. This is a big issue, and most of you know it. One of the uh, goals of the government administration is to provide more cell service, okay? One of the goals of the administration is to provide really good GPS service. The trouble is they're butting heads right now, okay? Light Squared is a startup 4G network, cell network, okay? They want to use satellite data, but they want to use it for, they also want to use um, terrestrial broadcast, all right? The trouble is, where they stuck these guys was right next to the, the GPS L1 signal. And it really matters. It really matters because it's such a strong broadcast, it's going to create interference and indeed wipe out even reception for a lot of GPS receivers that are near this. I'll explain that. Um, okay, so, so there, well, let's, let's bring this up. The L1 frequency, if you will, 1575.42 megahertz is right here, okay? Light squared wants to broadcast in two bands, 1550 to 55, 1526 to 31, lower, upper. The trouble is modern GPS receivers and even legacy receivers, if you look at that gold line, have an expanded filter to get that weak signal from GPS. Every time that frequency band comes down from a satellite, it's being modulated by code and navigation messages. And when it does that, it kind of expands that signal. You've got a spread spectrum effect. The, the filters on a modern receiver are opened up to get that signal. Well, the trouble is they're wiped out by this light squared power. All right? So, Light Squared wants to broadcast up to 1,500 watts of power on 40,000 towers or stations around the country. Now, what they'll tell you is this. They'll tell you that, uh, well, this was from a webinar, by the way, at the end of April. Uh, Jim Kirkland, Trimble, Nick Yakshik, uh, Public Policy Global Equipment Manufacturers. The... Uh, I want to mention this, too, before I forget it. The Federal Aviation Administration next-gen system is very heavily reliant on GPS. These are the guys probably affected, as far as safety of life goes, the most by this issue. So they said this. They said, okay, Light Squared says, well, look, back in 2004, we talked about all this. You know, we agreed on this. Well, what they agreed on is this. They could have 2,415 stations, and they could broadcast at 26 watts of power just to fill out their network. Well, they didn't agree to 40,000 stations broadcasting at 1,500 watts. Big difference. Big difference. The problem is not 
um, a receiver problem. It's actually a physics problem. The, the GPS receivers can reject 100,000 times the power of a GPS receiver next to it, but not a billion times more, which is really an effect what we've got here. So it, it's, it's, to me, it's unresolvable. They say that at the lower band, that 1526 to what it was, a 31 or something, they say it's less of an effect, but it still is an effect um, to everybody. Now, how far away is that? Well, uh, they say that it's up to light squared to resolve this. They have to show there's no interference. Uh, they have to proceed at their own risk. They have to do anything they have to do to resolve it, and they have to give us time to make to to review this study that's going to be submitted June 15th, only it didn't happen. They got an extension of two weeks, so they haven't even submitted the report yet. They set up the equipment. Uh, uh, testing was done by the National Space Base Position Navigation and Timing Engineering Forum and others, um, FAA, John Deere, a whole bunch of people. But the, the, the bottom result was if you consider only the fact that within a couple kilometers, if you will, we're affected by that for our work. In an urban area like New Orleans, these are the cell towers in New Orleans. If they want 40,000 receivers, there's going to be a lot of towers, and especially in urban areas. Consider a plane trying to land at Louis Armstrong International Airport, and the effect it's going to have on that plane, it's going to be wiped out. It's not going to be able to use GPS. This is the next-gen system they want to use, this is wiped out by Light Square's plan. So the, the report's going to be submitted. Uh, where are we now? We're probably in about a week or so, hopefully, unless they get another extension. But that's where we are. That's the problem. The problem is not just one little tower sitting somewhere. It's a, it's a nationwide system of towers at 1,500 watts that's going to wipe out the L1 frequency. OK? Dense urban env environment, they're going to be spaced less than a kilometer apart. That effectively just, you can't work there. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Not with GPS anyway. OK? Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to take, make this point our break. I'm about four minutes early. But uh, if we take, what, about a half hour, Roy? Or what do we got? Yeah, that's good. Anybody have a question or comment about either light squared or real time so far? After, after the break, we're going to talk about best field methods. If not, Ronnie? Are you going to talk any more about what you mean by redundancy? Yeah. Yes. That's uh, part of the guidelines. So we're going to, we can talk about that after the break. Uh, the break is scheduled for half an hour. So let's do that. Let's take a break. To right yes, sir. Um, you said you need homogeneous conditions base and rover. Ideally, yeah. Try, try not to get over 10 kilometers. Well, yeah. If you're in a network and you're 40 kilometers. Yeah. The difference. How do you know the conditions? You don't. You're trusting your network. The, the, the question was, uh, you're saying don't go more than 10 kilometers. The, the point there being, if, if you have a single base condition, that's a good. If you have a network, like you were saying, um, hopefully they're going to cover a spread around you, not just from one station but around you with five or six, they're going to interpolate conditions for where you are. So the 10 kilometer rule is out. That's a big advantage of a real-time network. So um, how far apart can they be and still give you a good answer? We're seeing them spread out. Roy. Well, the point is that you want, just like in any kind of geodetic uh, network, you want to be inside the network. Right? When you get to the outside, you then essentially are dealing with. Yeah. Good point. Excellent point. So we have, uh, in our network, we have stations a couple hundred miles offshore to allow people to work who are working in mm. coastline areas. Great. And even though that's a long way away, it puts you inside the network, and so it helps. Can you submit them to be cores so we can do Opus RS by the coast? <laughs> Ryan says you've got to be able to level them to cores. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes, sir. I know with the, the light squared and the LTE, they 
they did the test, I think, in Arizona recently. Yes. And there was, uh, the GPS users were saying it was the end of the world, like, yeah. they saying, no, we didn't call interference. What, what's the truth? Yeah. The question is, what is what is the truth of Light Squared? Light Squared saying it's okay, and everybody else saying it's the end of the world. Uh, yeah, the truth's in between, but basically, the people most affected by this are the people using high precision receivers. That's us, and the FAA, and a lot of other people. So the John Deere's, the the Garmin's, they can be affected, but only very close to the towers. Um, it's not going to help when you're in the city. You know, it's not going to be good. But it's it, what it does is it just kills us for our work, especially real time. Did the tests affect maybe four sites in the area in Arizona where they tested the technology? The, yeah, they. I th the way I understand it, and I don't claim to be an expert on this whole situation, uh, just a general sense. The way I understand it is Light Squared set up the equipment and other people did the testing. That was my understanding. They're also, of course, complaining about how Light Squared set up the equipment. So, so the power they're using might not be the power they're going to broadcast at, blah, blah, blah. Uh, though, it, just physically, in a, in a physics sense, an electrical engineering sense, it's impossible for GPS to, res to resist a billion times the power of its signal adjacent to it. 100,000 times? Yeah but not a billion times. So that's the whole problem. Now, how are they gonna resolve that? I hope they just give them a d different frequency allocation and take that out of the mix. L they're saying, well, we can use the lower band, that at 1526 to 31. It's still gonna kill a lot of people. You know, maybe, maybe you have to be a little bit closer maybe, but it's still gonna be a problem. So why not just try to find somewhere <laughs> to work, you know, somewhere else? You know, I don't know if that's possible or not. Frequencies are really tough to, to allocate, I know. I don't know if anybody has a better spin on that. But Did you have a question, sir? Or? No. Is that, I mean, it's, it's, we won't really know. I, I've seen preliminary results submitted to the, that NPEF, okay? And it just shows more or less with those couple slides what, what, what you saw. So we won't know definitively until that report is submitted, and then there's uh, time to respond to it. So we're still waiting. But to me, it's just physically impossible the way it is right now. So it wasn't as bad as when the core site in that area just shut down while they were working past, was it? No. Um, I, don't, I, think, I can't remember exactly where they tested this either. I don't know whether it was White Sands or somewhere else. Um, the only thing I can tell you is I can, uh, if you give me email or send me an email. By the way, I have a card out on the table out there if anybody wants to pick it up. If you send me an email, I'll try to give you an answer. You know, I don't claim to be an expert in that issue. I just know that some of the basics of the issue. So can't give you a great answer, but I can find out for you. Okay, any other? Let's take our break till 10.15.